What is up, Bitcoiners? This is CK from Bitcoin Magazine, and I just sat down with Wes Fulford of Verdi Funds. Wes is a pioneer in the Bitcoin mining ecosystem. He was the CEO of BitFarms, and now he is pioneering something completely new. He is launching an ETF called RIGS that invests and operates the under, in the underlying technology that powers the Bitcoin network, right? So if you want exposure to the semiconductors, to the mining ecosystem, to all of the other aspects of the Bitcoin infrastructure, that is what Riggs is here to do. Uh, Wes and I talk about why, what's the impetus for this product and why Bitcoin is going to, going to continue to be successful and why the market needs something like this. Then we dive into what is happening in the greater semiconductor and Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot going on. And, you know, as of even four or five weeks ago, we had some of the greatest turbulence in mining hash rate uh, in Bitcoin history. But yet this is positive for Bitcoin. Wes covers all of that on this podcast. I hope you guys enjoy this one. What is up, Bitcoiners? I'm sitting across the screen from Wes Fulford, a gentleman who has done an enormous amount in the Bitcoin space. And I'm excited to be sitting across from him again to talk about something new that he is pioneering. Um, Wes, you are launching uh, Vidity Funds uh, and you have uh, and you have been a part of the Bitcoin mining industry for a long time. And you're bringing this amazing new ETF product to the market, something that I have not heard of before. It is a hash rate ETF. Uh, why don't you kind of just talk a little bit about what you're building? Yeah, so thanks for having me uh, today, and yeah, super excited to be back on uh, on your podcast. But uh, you know, just a clarification: where uh, Verdi Funds is a registered investment advisor, um, incorporated earlier this year, and uh, we're a institutional or retail fund manager launching in the midst of launching our first product. So today's our trading debut of of Rigs, uh, which is a Bitcoin mining and semiconductor ETF and the, the, the sort of plan of attack or um, fundamental value proposition of, of this ETF is the fact that we are investing in the infrastructure that underpins the, the Bitcoin network. So as you, as you would know, the, uh, you know, the miners have an essential service that they're providing, which is the validation and verification of, of trades. And um, just, just given the sort of, nascent nature of the public markets in this sector um you know we've expanded the the portfolio allocation to further down the value chain in terms of uh, some of the semiconductor companies and the manufacturers of equipment themselves so we really, really want to be uh an infrastructure offering a, a, a niche niche product in the financial markets targeting retail and institutional investors but um you know, for all the same reasons you buy a publicly traded cryptocurrency miner, the same would apply to our, our ETF here. It's uh, leveraged exposure to the underlying commodity. It's an actively managed product, I think, leveraging our team's background, mine in particular, and financial markets before I got into the Bitcoin space as a former investment banker dealing with, you know, building models and public market valuations and peer group analysis. Um, you know, we, we do believe that there's some fairly prominent or, or obvious mispricings in the public markets with some of these entities and uh, intend to capitalize on that to bring a superior return product to the, the average investor. Amazing. So yeah, and excuse, uh, excuse my mistake there. It's not, I guess, uh, a hash rate ETF, but more again, the underlying technology. Can you kind of talk about, you know, why uh, an ETF like this um, you know, is helpful um, to investors. Uh, you know, you mentioned it's kind of similar to uh, why an investor would purchase uh, a public miner, but um, obviously this is a little bit different. And um, you know, it's 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 a a different way of getting a similar exposure. Can you just kind of talk about like why why is this product uh, differentiated and needed? Yeah, we didn't want to go out there and get sort of wrapped around the axle, recreating a wheel here. We're not. Um, bringing a Bitcoin ETF to the to the public markets. Obviously, there's been some success with Purpose and Evolve and 3IQ up here in Canada on the BTF Bitcoin ETF front or, or Ether ETF front. Um, but 
you know, in the in the U.S., it's still a question mark around timing with with SEC approval with the ten plus applications that are outstanding today. So this is a an ETF focused on investing in the public equities, and you know, the, the benefit of that is that all of these equities, all of the fund holdings, have have gone through these sort of hurdles and, and regulatory process required to list their equity on a, on a global exchange. And they're, you know, have to abide by governance protocols and continuous disclosure requirements that, that uh, are part of the whole public realm or a publicly traded uh, requirement uh, as a listed entity. So investing in the equities, um, again, I think the, the markets are evolving. There's been a number of uh, announced transactions with SPACs or other that are working on sort of execution and moving towards closing. So we expect there to be a number of new names that we can own and, and hold uh, later this year and, and into the sort of Q1 and Q2 of 2022. But uh, again, like really like pursuing an active man or a product that that is underpinned by an active management strategy the average retail investor that doesn't have that sort of deep operational expertise. And again, leveraging our, our team's experience, um, my, mine building bit farms to, to what it is today, publicly listed company on the NASDAQ operating on 100% renewable energy. Um, I think the average retail and institutional investor is having a tough time sort of backing into cash flows and operational differences and, and understanding the impact of hardware efficiency in terms of profitability. And, uh, you know, we're, we're leveraging our skill set and our ability to identify stars and dogs and, and, uh, and sort of product that does a better job of providing exposure to the sector rather than that sort of shotgun basket approach that many retail institutions are, are per- pursuing today. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of people, they're just buying all the mining stocks or they're buying any stock that has to do with BTC or, you know what, there's kind of a different yeah. ways to go about it. But um, obviously, you bring the expertise of you know, just knowing the mining space so intimately. Um, I guess, in and, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, not answer this question. But in terms of the actual fund strategy, um, you know, are you looking into like something like an NVIDIA or something like, you know, that is like, not necessarily just the miner, but you know, how, how far into the components are you looking like, are you going to get into like, you know, the the silicon and the look uh the lithium components as well like you know i i guess just trying to understand a little bit more about you know the breadth of this uh of this product yeah so uh the wonderful thing about an etf is the fact that like the the fund allocation is fully transparent published on our website so it'll 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 land and and be disclosed at the end of the day with our with our trading deb- debut here but um you know we're not going as far down the value chain to get into some of the, like the you know the 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 material stocks, the mining stocks, the um, but but we are going absolutely at the at the semiconductor level, investing in the Nvidia's and, and AMD's and TSMC's and Samsung's of the world, just because they are such a, a critical component of this value chain. And I'm, I'm sure you're keenly aware of of the hardware environment right now and um, how it's evolved. Even the last month, this thing is really changing at, at the speed of light in terms of supply available and demand and pricing. So uh, we, we really do think that there, there is a, um, you know, a value add to the portfolio owning some of these bigger foundries and semiconductor companies, just, just given the fact that um, they're a core component of the value chain and they do offer a lot more market cap and liquidity, which is, which is uh advantageous when you're running an ETF where there could be daily redemptions and subscriptions and you have to be able to manage that those capital flows. Makes sense. So um, let's talk a little bit about the the greater kind of space around mining. You mentioned, you know, obviously we're in a very turbulent time, both for Bitcoin mining in particular, but, you know, semiconductors and chips uh, in general, uh, supply chains are kind of in a uh, a very strange place uh, post 2020. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm just kind of curious based on what you're seeing right now, uh, if you could give us a little bit of uh, what's on your purview of, of the, this kind of like global uh, situation. Yeah, there's no secret that there's been this uh, um, bottleneck at the foundry level from, from a, a chip standpoint. Um, 
miners would have ideally sort of uh, secured much larger allocations earlier this year in response to the sort of peak demands or heightened demand uh, versus a year ago. Um, but but the fact is, like all industry are experiencing this supply constraint, like looking at the size of this sector relative to like U.S. auto um, and, and how Bitmain and, and MicroBT and others are trying to compete for wafer allocations. It's just not possible to go secure additional slots. And in addition, so, so in addition to not being able to ramp production at the chip level or secure more supply of chips that underpin these miners, um, there's been, you know, obviously lots of rumors around some of the core inputs into the into the chip manufacturing process with with uh, you know supply issues some of the some of the the fluids and et cetera that are required to manufacture semiconductors and it's impacted yields it's impacted actual production so predicting the supply chain and actual deliveries of your hardware if you're able to secure bulk has been a major issue for management teams and boards. Um, and in, in addition to being like, you know, prudent allocators of capital or, or you know, fulfilling their fiduciary responsibility to shareholders and making sure that every dollar going out the door to secure equipment is being spent in a, in a prudent fashion. They're focused on ROI. They're not overpaying for chips and getting caught up in the hype cycle. So, you know, we've seen dramatic swings in, in pricing throughout 2021 earlier um, as recently as three months ago, we were seeing bulk shipments at $80, $85, $90 a terahash, having to wait six months plus for delivery. Obviously, with what's happened in China over the last four to six weeks with, with this sort of exodus of hash rate and shut, shutdowns in sort of major mining provinces, we're seeing a lot more orders coming to market that were previously secured by locals that are being sell sold um, in, in secondary markets as well as um, you know used equipment looking for new infrastructure and in other global jurisdictions that um, is come for sale and has impacted prices per tera hash so so the miners themselves can actually um, you know generate better returns assuming they've got the balance sheet to support sort of near-term orders I mean, it seems like a lot of uh, Western located miners that, you know, kind of didn't turn off throughout this process uh, are doing relatively well. Um, I saw some statistics of uh, some of the the North American miners that are, you know, now, you know, occupying, uh, you know, multi percentages of the Bitcoin uh, network altogether, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Wes, can you kind of talk about um, in terms of like the semiconductor shortage? you know, for someone who's maybe a little ignorant to, you know, what is causing that, can you, can you just shed a little bit of light on like the underlying issue here? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a ramp of, of in demand from some of the big telcos and, and uh, mobile phone manufacturers like this move to smaller chipsets and 5G rollouts and um, a lot of, uh, orders and, and wafer allocation slots that were canceled in the sort of early waves of the, of the pandemic um, that probably weren't necessary. So some of those bigger consumers coming back, trying to ramp production in response to demand that, that, that was, was non-wavering throughout the pandemic. Like again, the US auto sector, there's been some record sales for some automobiles, but yet they've, they've been failing to secure some of the core components for the manufacturing process. And, um, you know, I think it's um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But at the end of the day, this is all pan- pandemic driven, even at the, at the foundry level. If, if it wasn't direct sort of order related impact, it's a function of like not being able to staff manufacturing facilities, foundries to the levels that they're currently accustomed to, given social distancing requirements, et cetera. So, um, really interesting to see how this plays out. We're obviously very optimistic about the performance of the foundries from a, from a valuation and share price appreciation standpoint and, and, and want to make sure we've got an allocation to the sector, just given what's been playing out in the chip side of things. Yeah. And then in terms of, you know, again, North American or non-Chinese based miners, um, you know, a lot of them are, you know, purchasing these rigs. 
um, that you know were previously purchased or secured within China. Um, and and we're kind of starting to see, like, let's just say uh, this hash rate even come back online. Do you have any predictions on, you know, how long it will take to kind of return to that all time high hash rate? And um, and I guess what have you learned about Bitcoin from, you know, this unprecedented experience? Right. Um, there definitely was a disruption, but personally, I was impressed by how anti-fragile it seems the system is. Yeah, it's uh, it's been very interesting to see it, to watch it play out and without question to be a miner of scale located anywhere outside of China in sort of more politically stable mining jurisdictions. It's been a phenomenal development, right? To see hash rate pull off the levels that have had, that it has. I mean, this record sort of 28% drop in difficulty, the, the largest single drop in the history of the Bitcoin network. I mean, all, 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 all things equal from a BTC stamp, BTC pricing standpoint, transaction fees, um, at, you know, the productive capacity in terms of cash flow of your hash flower, his, uh, cash flow of your hash rate has sort of grown by 28%, like all, all else being equal. So you're, you're, you're generating more cash on, on your compute. We're seeing rev per tera hash, which is that metric that, that has become sort of the dominant force in terms of mining economic returns um, sitting back at like late January, early February levels with with North American miners of scale now occupying occupying a bigger component of the network, a bigger market share and, and thus a bigger share of the 900 BTC on average and, and block rewards paid out daily. So uh, great, great time to be operating scale here in the North American markets. Um, it's one thing it has shed light on is the fact that there was an absolute ton of hash power is, and, and that's no secret and located in mainland China, everybody's sort of estimating that that's somewhere between 60 and 70% of the, of the network hash rates. And to see this huge pullback on the back of this ban is, is just really, you know, validated and shed light on that fact since, and, and in terms of how long that takes to ramp, find new homes, and uh, sort of compute power to climb back to where it was in, at the end of Q1 um, or, or uh, late May is to be determined. But the fact is, I mean, like just drawing upon my experience at Bit Farms, you know, it would take us four to five, six months to stand up, you know, a 30 megawatt facility, the one we built in Sherbrooke in 2019. Just given the fact that the the high voltage electrical distribution components that go into this these bank, these these data centers running mining equipment uh, can be uh, a supply chain issue as well, and we were having to pre order and make deposits on equipment like months, if not a year ahead of an intended build, because there's a four or five month manufacturing timeline required for some of these big step down transformers and switches, etc. So. I think it's going to be quite some time before we see network hash rate ramp to where it was three or four months ago, just given the fact that you can't turn the switch from an infrastructure standpoint um, on overnight. Like you can't, you can't add two gigahertz, two gigawatts worth of infrastructure in North America, like by September 1st, it just doesn't happen. There's, there's, there's timelines, there's, and then you can just, pulling cables and racking equipment, dealing with shipping and, and delivery logistics. Like there's, there's going to be uh, a pretty opportunistic time for, for North American miners and other global jurisdictions to make some serious money here. Um, while we're, while, we're, you know, that equipment is finding a new home outside of China. All right, let's take a quick break from that episode. I want to tell you guys about our sponsor. It is Bitcoin 2022 conference. I am sure you saw the videos. You may have been there in person. Bitcoin 2021 was an absolute smashing success. It was the biggest conference in Bitcoin history, crypto history, whatever history of the digital asset sphere. Bitcoin is number one and the Bitcoin 2021 conference is number one with a bullet. It was an absolutely incredible time. I was working my ass off the whole time, but I got to meet so many incredible community members. And I think the best testament to how amazing Bitcoin 2021 was, was not just all of the amazing, you know, 
accolades and, uh, and compliments that I got personally and our team got, but also it's the skin in the game in Bitcoin 2022. We have already sold close to 1,500 tickets. That is more than 10% of the people, everyone who went to Bitcoin 2021 have already purchased tickets to Bitcoin 2022. We have not released a date. We have not released a city. We have not released anything. That is the biggest compliment. That is the biggest skin in the game of the community being down for this conference. Bitcoin 2022 is going to be bigger than Bitcoin 2021. It is going to be better than Bitcoin 21 in every single way. And we are going to be bringing you the best opportunity to mingle with the biggest, the baddest, the most Bitcoin people on the planet. So join the revolution. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Get your tickets today. I don't know what the ticket prices are. They are going up. I think they're $249 right now. We just rolled out fiat ticket uh, purchases. All the tickets purchased before today were all purchased in BTC. So get it, guys. Get it. Get this ticket. Be at Bitcoin 2022. See you there. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you guys about The Deep Dive. The Deep Dive is a new premium newsletter from the Bitcoin Magazine team in conjunction with my man, BTCization, Dylan LeClaire. Dylan is such a multifaceted and wide-ranging analyst. He does everything from on-chain analytics to macro uh, analysis to uh, uh, you know hash rate and all that kind of good stuff. He does it all. He breaks down everything that's happening every single day with his daily dive. He's going to dive into what is happening in the market that day. So that way you don't have to pay attention to Twitter. You don't have to pay attention to anything else. You can just pay attention to the deep dive and he has you covered. And at the end of the week, guess what? You get a weekly recap. And at the end of the month, hey, we have a freaking report, a beautiful PDF breaking down all the activity of that entire month, what it means for Bitcoin, what you can expect moving forward. The Bitcoin market is going to moon. We are here to make sure that we maximize your stack. Go to members.bitcoinmagazine.com to sign up today. And if you use promo code BITS, you can get one month for free. So again, the deep dive. I've been checking it out every day and you should too. Back to the show. Is there a jurisdiction um, in particular that you think uh, stands the most to win? Um, I guess globally, is, is it just North America or is it somewhere else? Hey, so a lot of the the compute uh, equipment trying to head to Kazakhstan and, and other sort of major beneficiaries of this, this hash rate exodus in, in China. And, but like, look, there's, you know, there, there's rumors of a, a potential tariff for, or uh, tax being um, sort of levied against Kazakhstan based miners, just given how much demand there has been. And, and, you know, in 2017, on sort of Bitcoin's run to, to 20 grand, we saw, and I'm just drawing again upon my, my experience as CEO of BitFarms, um, we saw like 18,000 megawatts worth of demand in a province that only produces about 35,000 megawatts. Like like half half of the electrical grid worth of demand from like miners all over the world. So there's gonna be um, jurisdictions, certainly in North America that are the beneficiaries of uh, some of this this compute power moving outside of China. Um, in terms of where that's going to be, I mean, it's really a function of like where the industrial scale cheap power is. Um, you know, operators really sort of turning focus to trying to find stranded energy sources, renewable energy sources, and, and jurisdictions that um, are supportive of the development, ongoing development of the sector. You know, Texas has obviously got a lot of activity right now. Um, Quebec is a different animal just in terms of um, all of the sort of regular regulatory red tape and moratoriums that, that have been posed on the sector. Upstate New York, obviously lots of cheap power available there. You, you've, you've seen the, the political mess that ensued with a, you know, a moratorium bill that was intended to be passed that was voted down by one of the labor unions or contested by one of the labor unions. It's, uh, it's gonna be really interesting to, to see how this plays out, but at the end of the day, in the midst of this pandemic with some of the sort of economic retraction that's occurred in, in, in many global jurisdictions, there's going to be lots of, lots of countries and states and provinces that will attempt to attract, um, compute and, and, and grow industry locally. 
Okay. So my last question, and then, um, and then I'll let you go here, Wes. I know you got a busy day ahead of you, but I'm kind of curious about your takes on the, the recent, um, ESG ire that Bitcoin has been getting and, uh, maybe even shed some light into why hash rate leaving China, uh, might start to be a positive, uh, a positive in the energy mix of, uh, that powers Bitcoin. But, um, I guess I'll pass it back to you in terms of, um, you know, where you see Bitcoin, uh, along the, public perception of ESG and uh, maybe where it is uh, in terms of reality. Yeah. At, at Brady funds with, with the launch of rigs or our crypto mining and, and semiconductor ETF, we've actually got a, a clean energy focus. We're, we're, um, you know, targeting the majority of our, our mining investments to be uh, allocated to operators that are currently powered by Know, cleaner fuels, renewable sources of power, or are intending to move there very quickly if they're not currently running on renewable sources. Um, look, Bitcoin, just stepping back to first principles, I think it does an extremely good job of addressing the social and governance in ESG, given the fact that, you know, what the value proposition, what it represents is you know, bringing banking to the unbankable, um, you know, a sovereign currency not tied to the printing presses of one particular government treasury it's um and then on on the governance side you've got a network that's you know maintained by a distributed network of of miners that are incentivized by the protocol and and uh it's sort of not governed by one centralized entity so like the SNG are addressed very well with the core product of of the the mining ecosystem um the e is obviously had a lot of sort of interesting and, and, and negative public sentiment. I, I personally think it's quite overdone and, and a bit tired. Like, I, th I think I can still claim that, you know, my, my, during my times at BitFarms, we probably scaled the largest portfolio of industrial compute um, solely powered by renewable energy in the public markets. Um, and I think most management teams and boards are, are really focused on that with the evolution of you know, the, the Bitcoin Mining Council and the Crypto Climate Accord and pressures from shareholders and media, you know, boards and management teams have a responsibility to evaluate their operations and their, their growth objectives and, and be targeting sort of cleaner sources of fuel. And, and uh, it's, it's heading there on its own accord and the product that we brought to market is just going to support that initiative. Awesome. Well, Wes, I really appreciate you coming on and teaching me a little bit what you're building over at, over at Verity and uh, with Riggs. Um, Wes, why don't you tell the Bitcoin Magazine audience where they can learn a little bit more about you and what you're building? Yeah, so you can uh, visit our website, uh, veritifunds.com. Um, Riggs will, you know, all the disclosure, the fun facts will be available there biographies on on the people behind rigs and, and uh, definitely stay tuned I mean this will be the the first of hopefully many products we've got um, intentions to uh, innovate new crypto products within this ecosystem and uh, working aggressively to to bring to bring more interesting uh, ways to get exposure to the sector to the public markets Awesome. Well, I know that the public markets are thirsty for exposure. So thank you for bringing a new product and uh, for all that you do in the Bitcoin space. Cheers, Wes. Thank you. Thank you.